Hello everyone, I am Mike Senior and I am here with the man who has been putting the twerk back into Puppet Workshop, <laughs> Mr John Witten. <laughs> <laughs> Took me ages to work that one out. <laughs> Oh, a well-spent morning, if ever I've heard one, Mike. <laughs> As you can see in this 13th episode of Project Studio Tea Break, I have earned my tea break this month. I should say so. <laughs> How about you, John? Oh, goodness me, yes. <laughs> I, I got back a few days ago from a festival in France, which was great fun. Oh, wow. My first outdoor festival of the year. Was it a bit nippy? It was a tad nippy. I was wearing coats, as was all the audience. Thankfully, no umbrellas <laughs> needed. Right. We arrived a bit late, and not everything was quite set up, according to Ryder, so, you know. These things happen at festivals, it's a standard issue. Yeah. But the singer of the uh, the group for which I was playing was quite rude to the techs. <laughs> oh dear. It's a tactical <laughs> error, isn't it? It is a tactical <laughs> error. I don't believe I've ever heard or indeed told a story that goes, was quite rude to the techs, and then... It all went brilliantly. Br exactly! That just doesn't happen. <laughs> which is why I was getting steadily more and more nervous as we played the gig and everything was going fine. <laughs> it's the build-up. Yeah. The calm before the storm of sorts. Yeah. So we get to the last song of the set. Da -dum. Really? Really? Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, I was da -dum, carrying da -dum, da -dum. this tension throughout. I mean, you're, you're feeling it now. Imagine 90 minutes of that feeling. So this, this singer likes their vocals to be pretty much clean, you know, nothing on there. Mm. And the last song is, is pretty much entirely a cappella. It's, it's just them. Mm. And as they start singing, we realise this is big, spacey reverb on his voice. And, and, you know, we've been pretty clear about this, and it's a bit confusing. I sneak off to the side of the stage where there are some other techs. And, um, of course, the person controlling our live sound is right out in the audience. They've got one of those standalone tent things. Oh, yeah. So I sneak to the side of the stage and ask, look, can you radio over and say no reverb, please? Yeah. And the person says, certainly, and I will. All this happening in broken French, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, I would, what would I have given to have heard that? <laughs> that conversation. Oh, it was charming, I assure you. And so I, I go back centre stage and, well, not quite centre stage. I call my area centre stage. Wherever I stand, yeah. Mike, is centre stage. Yeah. A lot of people don't realise that. Wherever you lay your hat. <laughs> exactly. Your box of shorts. I give the singer a little smile and a nod, a little, that's sorted. Don't even worry about it. Yep. I got your back. <laughs> At which point, this kind of stereo delay <laughs> arrives <laughs> on his vocals. It's... Oh, oh Mike, it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> oh, that is fabulous. <laughs> and the, the, <laughs> so it's like, of course I'll take the reverb off and put this delay on instead. <laughs> Not even an instead. It was both. Oh. It was but the reverb didn't go anywhere, oh. I think. Do you think the patch was called, F*** you? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I would not be surprised. I have had a lot of time to think about this, and I'm convinced that the reverb was put on just to make it absolutely clear yeah. that he had heard us, yeah. that he had got the complaint. If he'd done nothing, <laughs> could have been a mistake. Could have been that they weren't able to get through to him. Oh, but <laughs> that is diamond. It was magnificent. It's a cautionary tale for us all, isn't it? I think so. Just, like, be a reasonably decent human being, especially to people who literally control your sound. Yeah, yeah. I think about the only more dangerous thing I could think of would be to have an argument with the pyrotechnics guy or the, or the guy who does your video. Oh, no, no, pyrotechnics is absolutely up there. Or, you know, the person who builds your stage. Yeah. That's a job that I had for about a year back in Cambridge a million years ago. I mean, basically, there's no job you ever haven't had. <laughs> I'm working on it. I mean, do you have to, like, print your CV on a bog roll or something? <laughs> well, that's normally where it winds up, so um, <laughs> it might save time. That's very considerate of you <laughs> to make sure that it's triple ply. Well, absolutely. I, you know, I don't want to cause discomfort as they literally <laughs> flush me away and out of consideration. But, you know, I did that job as best I could, but I can only imagine what a vengeful stage builder, what kind of havoc they could wreak. Oh, God, yeah. It doesn't bear thinking about. Mm, mm. How about you? Mike, besides that brilliant brilliant introduction that you gave me, which is <laughs> deserving of a tea break in and of itself. By what and which means have you earned this tea break this month? I don't know. I've been doing a lot of things rather too slowly, really. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think this month I need my tea break as a kind of a caffeine hit. Okay. To kind of get me going. And Tea breaks can be energisers. I'm, I'm totally on board with that. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm hoping, at least. Hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I can completely see that. And I'm sure that we will fill you with vim and vigor. I would be very curious to know if anyone else listens to this podcast as a up and at them sort of motivator. Well, we certainly, um, there's been lots of activity on the listeners front. I think they have earned their tea break. <laughs> Congratulations and welcome. Uh, you remember Matthias Fromm from the uh, Funlog podcast? I absolutely do. Well, he sent me an absolutely cracking um, synth watch meme. Oh, yes. That had been uh, created on sequencer.de, I think is the name of the site. Mm-hmm. Where some people had got busy with their copies of Photoshop and had done a fabulous 80s era Casio silver digital watch <laughs> into which they'd superimposed a called Kronos. <laughs> and another one where they'd done it with a Roland TV 303, one of those big long plastic <laughs> 80s wristwatches. But the best of all was one that was just ridiculous <laughs> called the Moog Patch Watch. Oh. <laughs> just just like a, a watch shaped 4x4 patch bay with like patch cords dangling out of it. That's amazing. <laughs> Gorgeous. I've been listening to his Funlog podcast to brush up on my um, technical German. Mm. And uh, they had a conversation about EQ the other day, mm-hmm. which alerted me to the fact that in German, a shelving filter is called a Kuhschwanzfilter. Goodness me. Which, to translate it literally, is a cow tail filter. <laughs> hey, you know what? That works. <laughs> I, I was all Because of the shape. Exactly. I was so ready to giggle at our German cousins, and they are <laughs> bag on. Although I had to say, I think it has more of a ring in English if you called it an oxtail filter. That's true. That would be a little snappier. It's also excellent because the word schwanz means tail, but it also has a slang meaning in German for another appendage. <laughs> I'm not going to ask how you, as someone who started learning German in his, I don't know, late 20s, I'm not even going to ask how you have found, have found out this slang meaning, what sort of nasty message boards you've been hanging out on. So it's got real staying power that time. I think I'm going to start calling it an octel filter, I think. I think so, after the German style. That's it. You have to append. And another listener, Daniel Plappert, had got in touch because he had heard uh, your double face palm last month. Oh, yeah. And he brought up an extremely important concern. Oh, yes. Which is, what is the collective noun for several face palms? Oh, God. Possibly that. Possibly an oh, God of face palms. <laughs> I think that's a group of three or more. I was looking through lists of collective nouns and seeing if I could find some suitable ones. Like, apparently for chickens, you can have a clutch of chickens. Okay. You kind of clutch your face when you face palm. <laughs> you could go to the educational value. You could do, like, fish, a school of face palms. Okay, well, that is, after all, what we aim to provide with our <laughs> face palmic content. Or something more descriptive. With goldfish, you've got a troubling of goldfish. <laughs> A troubling of face palms. I could jump on that. Or a pandemonium of parrots. Really? Is that a real one? Apparently, yeah. That's <laughs> lovely. I like that. Or you could go sarcastic. Oh, yeah. With uh, a shrewdness of apes. <laughs> a shrewdness of face palms. Or a tittering of magpies. There are a lot of good collective nouns, is what I'm learning today. There are some excellent ones. <laughs> And we have more follow-up as well from our news segment last month. Oh, yeah. The Voclia, Voclia Music Studio... Sorry. Voclia Music... Oh. <laughs> okay. The Voclia Music Studio... Oh, I've done it wrong again. The Voclia <laughs> Music Doubler Studio Kit. That's awesome. Finally. That's there. an outtake for the Patreons. We can just snip that five minutes of you saying Voclia <laughs> Music <perfect>. Studio. <laughs> So, <coughs> the Voclia Music Doubler Studio Kit. Beautiful. The Kickstarter campaign now has only four days to go, and it is standing at £185,000 from a target of 40 k Incredible. It's fabulous. There's no question, is there? They're going to make it. I emailed them about the podcast, and they said they liked it. Hey, did they actually? They had it on in their office. They said they liked the podcast, they played it in their office, and they can't wait to send us each three free ones. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was the one. <laughs> That's brilliant news. <laughs> Very generous. Many thanks. <laughs> it's very considerate of them. And at the same time, sort of professionally necessary. We did say something nice about them. Mm, so it's mm. following the most basic of etiquette yeah. to send us each three free ones. And I mean, it would be a crying shame if somehow our opinion soured over time. <laughs> <laughs> Look. All we're saying is that we reserve the right to update uh, our feelings and propensities yeah. uh, with the changing winds of time and favour. Okay, so now we've got this month's extortion of the month out of the way. No, no, no. It's not even out of the way. I don't want to go a tiny bit further. It's just a... Uh, oh, God, far away. I'm not finished with this voice. It's a very fun voice to do. So I just I'm hearing a lot of very... <laughs> A lot of very troubling rumours mm. about issues with the unit and just having one or indeed three of my own to make sure that these rumours are baseless. I mean, it's the networking potential that has raised the greatest concerns. 
<laughs> Precisely exactly that. Used in ensemble environments. A lot of people on message boards saying that if you stack three on top of each other, they catch on fire. And I'm not saying I believe that. I'm just saying it would be nice to be sure. And now from the Project Studio News Desk. Good morning, and welcome to the Project Studio News Desk. My name is Jonathan Whitten, and I'm here with some big, big news about big, big music. Bigly. Bigly. Wow. There's just a lot of fun voices in this episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tune in each month to hear Mike and John have fun with silly voices. <laughs> I want to talk about music festivals. Okay, right. Um, well, it's coming up to the season, isn't it? It is. I had my first of the year just now. It was... Mm. A bit more middle-aged and warm cider and coats and stuff than the typical image of the summer of love. Mm. But it is beginning. Mm. And even at a time when independent music venues, live music venues are closing down from a lack of attendance while people Netflix and chill their way into oblivion, Mm. festivals are growing. Oh, that's good. Between 2011 and 2016, festival attendance went up by 75%. That's a hell of a growth rate. It is, isn't it? And, you know, this is one of the big questions about, really sorry to bring the mood down, Brexit. Oh. Yeah, yeah, huge amount of music tourism to the UK. For some reason, I don't know whether it's our brilliant weather, our excellent food, our charismatic denizens. Top quality mud. High quality mud. We are apparently the destination Mm. for music festivals. Wow. The, The Wikipedia entry for annual UK music festivals. There's over 200 on there. Blimey. And some of them, like, some of them you wouldn't believe are real. (laughs) Which brings me... This isn't going to be a quiz, is it? (laughs) Which brings me to the quiz section (laughs) of this news broadcast. I wonder how long it'd be before you'd get your revenge. (laughs) I have been on the receiving end of far too many of these to not occasionally get my own back. Yeah, Mm. go on then. Okay, so we're going to start with a few super happening dance festivals i'm just going to tell you the name you're going to tell me whether they are real or fake (laughs) number one bang face (laughs) bang face bang face the word bang followed by the word face oh it can't no that can't (laughs) be real bang face (laughs) that one mike (laughs) is absolutely real no (laughs) that sounds like a euphemism Oh dear. Doesn't it just though? I don't even want to think about what that's a euphemism for. No, no, me neither. I mean, that's only an inch away from face palm, isn't it? <laughs> you could call a face palm slap face, couldn't you? I think bang face is actually just a particularly intensive face palm, isn't it? <laughs> so, just to give you a rough feeling for bang face, mm. I'm on their website now, and the press image that they've chosen yeah. is a raucous crowd. And someone's crowd surfing, except they're crowd surfing in a large inflatable car, wearing their underwear on their head. So, <laughs> bangfaceweekender.com for, for a little <laughs> grab of that image. It's well worth it, as I'm sure you can imagine. That's great. <laughs> Okay, rushing through these next few. Um, second one, Jiggle Max. Jiggle Max. One word, Jiggle Max. No, jiggle I, can't, Max. I can't get that one either. <laughs> that, that can't be right. Bang Face is a real festival, Jiggle Max isn't. <laughs> I'm glad about that because following your second face palm story last month, I was thinking it could have been related to that. <laughs> oh, you know, I can't remember my second face palm from last month. I think I managed to blot that out. It was the hippie orgy that you played. Oh, goodness me. That could have been Jiggle Max. By making it a face palm, I'd managed to not think about it for a week for the first time since it had happened a couple of years ago so <laughs> you've expunged it i'd managed to get rid of it and you very kindly put it back just so so thank you just do my job ma'am yeah <laughs> okay next up beat herder now that one sounds possible actually beat herder you are bang on beat herder oh, is huge wow, and banging i only want Rather than a dance music festival, Mm. I want it to be a folk festival where beet growers and sheep herders can (laughs) join together in their love of, you know what, whatever genre of music they feel like. I mean, I thought that beet herder might be some kind of a... An EDM country crossover thing, where loads of people in kind of chaps and cowboy hats kind of get blissed out. I would go to that. I don't know about you. It sounds perfect, yeah. What you're describing to me sounds pretty bloody wonderful. Okay, we're going to jump on now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Because that is entry level for weird festival names. That's just the amuse-bouche. That is a preface. All that's come before is prologue. Welcome, Mike. 
to metal festivals. Oh, Heavy wow. metal God, festivals. This, that's a rich vein, I bet. Yeah, this is marking the first World Metal Congress year. <laughs> the, yeah, honestly, they have a conference now. Oh, surely they could come up with something better than Congress. I mean, honestly. <laughs> have they no imagination? Coven? What? Summit? I don't know. Something that's a bit more Lord of the Rings. I do see what you mean, but I'm on their website, and they managed to make it look really metal. Oh, right. Like, it's all... Daggers, it's smoke machines, there's a lot of face tattoos. Um, <laughs> yeah. And some discussions of the economic implications of Brexit uncertainty. It's a, <laughs> Whoa. It's a good combination. Okay, so uh, okay. the first metal festival I would like to propose to you, real or not real, Beer Mageddon. Oh. Now, is that the kind of lazy pun that a metal fan would come up with? Or the lazy pun that John, 20 minutes ago, would come up with? <laughs> yeah, and I think he did, actually. Because <laughs> the thing about Beer Mageddon... <laughs> now, you see, I could get with things with Mageddon coming on the end, but mm. the idea of actually selling it on the fact that everyone's going to be shit-faced... <laughs> I think it might be just one step beyond where a promoter would go at this point in time. One degree past realistic. Yeah. Well, it's real. No! It's, no! Uh, yes, it is. It's absolutely true. <laughs> beer Mageddon. No! How beer the, Mageddon, What is it like a combination of a beer festival and a metal gig? <laughs> Now, this one, I don't have the website up for, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I think... Have you no sense of curiosity? Are you dead inside? <laughs> I had Beat Herder to look up. I had Bang Face Weekender to look up. I was busy with some very curious things. Um, oh. Okay, the second and final question here. Right. Metal music festivals, mm. Death Fest. One word, Death Fest. Straightforward, oh. straight down the line. Honestly, after all of that, it just sounds a bit too boring. <laughs> A bit uncreated. It does. You're going to think, oh, surely they could have come up with demons of death or <laughs> lords of death or fellowship of doom. Fellowship of doom. Festive, festive death. <laughs> festive death I would have gone to. But Death Fest, again, is an actual real festival which you can buy tickets to and attend. Oh, my God. So we got one of those right. Does everyone, like, dress up as Cookie Monster then? <laughs> now, like, again, what? that would be a festival I'd go and see. <laughs> I mean, the concession stand to be fantastic. I ought to know how we got from Death Fest to Cookie Monster, please. Well, it's because of what uh, Pat said last month about uh, the, the rule of thumb for death metal. Oh, yes. The lead singer sounded like Cookie Monster. There you go, there you go. So I think everyone, exactly as you say, is dressed up as Cookie Monster. I don't have the website to hand, so we're just going to have to assume that that is true. Mm -mm. Now, a type of festival which didn't make it in to this quiz, mm. <laughs> but deserves an honourable mention, are punk festivals festivals, punk music festivals, yeah. who um, find themselves in a tricky situation. And I do sympathise because a music festival requires a huge amount of organisation and coordination and bureaucracy. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, people working together for money. It's not very punk. <laughs> 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 Especially an annual one, you know, where you've got annual commitments and you've got yeah. music licensing questions and technicians. And sponsors. And then the whole point of punk was kind of to stick it to the man. Absolutely. And all of those things have to be sponsored, so it's like, the man presents punk. <laughs> yes. The antithesis of punk, isn't it? The man presents f*** the man 2019. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's funny you should get to there, because that's exactly what I wanted to uh, bring up. Oh, right. Their anarchic nature has been channeled straight into the name of these festivals. <laughs> I just wanted to leave you with two of these. These are both real. Okay. This year, you could treat yourself to attending Give It a Name Festival. Give it a name? A sort of sarcastic 14-year-old approach where presumably they were told to give it a name. Utterly. And they were like, fine, give it a name festival. <laughs> A slightly less intellectual brand of humour, you could go to F*** Reading Festival. Oh, no. <laughs> really? Yeah. And where is it? Is it actually in Reading? I'm actually going to look this one up. I would love it if it were actually in Reading. <laughs> Don't you just? I do like that, though. If only for the crowd chance. <laughs> And also, the difficulty to rebel against this. If you wanted to start a group that strongly disapproved of this festival, it would be very difficult to name it. <laughs> f***ing <laughs> Reading Festival? You have all sorts of splinter groups, couldn't you? You're into a linguistic quagmire at that point. I think that actually that idea should be expanded into other areas. I think we should have bands called, like, f*** the Rolling Stones, or, <laughs> or even better, like, f*** Britney Spears. 
<laughs> kind of an amusing double meaning. So what you're talking about is like a tribute band. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I can't get that out of my head. I'm going to do this to you. F*** Foles. Oh, my. <laughs> really? We've gone there. Despair, despair, all ye who enter here. <laughs> you're, you're too deep now, listener. Nothing you can do but ride it out. Abandon hope. So it's like a tribute band, like the bootleg Beatles or oh, dear. Australian Led Zeppelin or whatever. But they just play the songs as badly as possible and as sarcastically as possible. <laughs> yeah. Although, of course, Britney Spears has got there before us, Mike. Oh, right. Have you ever heard the song If You Seek Amy? No. Okay, so it's a song called If You Seek Amy. And the chorus goes, Love me, hate me, say what you want about me, but all of the girls and all of the boys are wishing to If You Seek Amy. Oh, Which, God. if you sing it in an American accent, sounds like If You Seek Amy. Yeah. And it's bloody genius. I love Britney Spears. That woman does not get the credit she deserves. I have to say, that is clever. She's on the humour level of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Indeed. good she is. <laughs> Yeah. So that is the news this month. I have sad news to close with that the f**k Reading Festival is actually in Tottenham. (laughs) It's kind of weird. That's f**ked up. Breakers, I am so excited for what's about to happen. It would be no exaggeration to say that I've been waiting about two months to hear this because as devoted listeners will remember, Mike came to Berlin to do a session and we met up after the session and he would not give me the details because he was saving it yeah, for the yeah. podcast. And then last month, it was my turn to do face palms, so he would not tell me the details. I cannot <laughs> emphasize enough. I'm at boiling point right now. I cannot wait to hear this. Mike, take it away. Well, we have had a variety of different face bonds on the podcast. We've had phantom, we've had inadvertent, mm-hmm. we've had several wardrobe related ones. That's true. Ones with maple syrup. <laughs> but normally we're focusing on examples of our own incompetence because fundamentally that's where you kind of learn stuff from and it's fun. Mm-hmm. But this time I wanted to talk about a specific kind of face palm that we rarely touch on. Oh, yeah. It's the kind of face palm. In fact, I saw a great example of it in Curse of the Were Rabbit the other day. You know that Wallace and Gromit film? I do. It's where the, the baddie asks, How on earth could these tiny minded buffoons ever catch such a big rabbit? And Wallace replies, Um, with a big trap? <laughs> and at that point, Gromit face palms himself. It's that sign of incredulous desperation. <laughs> That's the kind of face palm we're talking about this month. Okay, I feel set up. I feel ready. Anyway. I was approached by quite a well-established independent songwriter-producer guy who has uh, been around for a while, you know, has budget behind him, interested in building long-term relationship with an audio engineer to work on his projects. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were thinking, yeah, this could really work. Let's meet up and do a kind of a test session. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to find a studio where we could just kind of meet up for a day and go from there. Mm. So I did some research to try and find a studio with lots of instruments and things and a nice kind of vibe and found one that looked good. Magnificent. You know, had all the instruments he needed, lots of characterful vintage preamps and mics and things and a cool decor. You know, those kind of slightly checkerboard patterns on the walls and in like acoustic panels and things. Yeah, it sounds all set for the first date. Yeah. I wanted to take all the variables out of the situation if I could because I knew I'd be travelling there on the train. Mm. So I thought, okay, I'll bring with me the core of my own location setup. So I brought like a wheelie rack and a big rucksack. Right. Now, I'm a bit obsessive, <laughs> as you know, about planning stuff in advance. This is true. This is true. And it was doubly so this time because it was effectively an extended job interview. Right. So I wanted, you know, to be able to work as fast as possible and there just not to be hiccups. So in advance, I planned a preliminary like 28 input setup so that I could quickly hop between different instruments, different mic options, right. without having to plug things up or whatever else. So we could just move quickly on the actual session. You know, I researched their mics on their website, built a full mic list, pre-configured my DAW with all the name tracks, everything, oh. you know, ran tone for all my signal paths, cables and everything to make sure <laughs> everything worked, pre-connected everything, pre-labeled everything. Can I just jump in here to say that it sounds to me like you are sufficiently well prepared that nothing can go wrong. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's preparation that ensures for a smooth running session. (laughs) (laughs) Neat. Right. So, questions this month. Oh, a question here from Martin Douglas. Oh, wait. Mike is is gesturing at me in the Skype window. What's that, Mike? 
<laughs> yeah, there's just a little postscript still. Oh, sorry, an, an epilogue to this heartwarming <laughs> story of how solid preparation <laughs> set Mike up for a totally uninteresting but very successful session. Yeah, yeah, okay. I decided to go the whole hog and actually go up a couple of days in advance of the session as well, so I could look at the studio. Mm. Everyone seemed friendly. You know, got um, arranged to meet them in advance at the place. You know, check to see what preamps, mic stands, all that kind of stuff were there. Mm. The desk was partially dismantled. Oh. Okay. But I knew this. Okay. They told me this. They said they were servicing it. But they assured me that the preamps were all still usable and I didn't need most of the desk. Right. I was just going to plug from their preamps into my system. It was all good. Even so, at that point, I already decided to change to a Mark II setup. <laughs> you know, scale back the input count slightly. And I arranged with the tech guy to meet up like three hours in advance of the session hmm. so that we could set up. <laughs> Mike, you're doing so well. You're doing so good. <laughs> I'm on the edge of my swivelly seat right now. I'd arranged with the client we were going to work from 12 noon. So I got there at fresh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. The tech guy turns up then as well. We get in there, and within a few minutes, we reach problem number one. Oh, dear. And that is actually connecting my system to theirs. You know, I'd already told them that everything on my system was on D sub connectors, you know, the 25 pin D sub connectors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'd also thought, well, just in case those don't work, I'll bring XLR breakout cables as well. Okay. Yep. Sounds really good. Right? Mm -hmm. They only had one direct D sub connection into their Bantam patch bay. Okay. And everything was on Bantams. Right. They had no XLR to Bantam looms. No! I just, okay. <laughs> oh. So I could only get eight channels into my system directly on this diddy little cable that <laughs> basically meant I had to have my rack pretty much backed up to the side of their patch bay. <laughs> <laughs> the tech guy kind of scratched his head nonchalantly and, and then fished around in a cupboard and brought out this disembodied lump of patch bay with XLR connectors hanging off the back of it. Oh, my God. He plugged that into a space in the rack and then was <laughs> testing through all the connections to make sure they worked. Yeah. I was kind of looking at the thing and going, OK, we're using a lot of time doing this. I'll move to set up Mark three. you know, <laughs> reduce the input count again. Mm. It took an hour and a half oh, wow. to get my system connected up to theirs. Wow. I mean, during this time, I'm freaking out slightly, as you can imagine, and yep. just setting up everything I can in advance. Mic stands, cable, <laughs> pre-plugging all the cables into the wall boxes and everything. Yeah. Before I've even got the system passing audio through it. <laughs> But it's going to look amazing. Yeah, it looked fabulous. It looked like we, we, we had something working. The second problem that came up pretty quickly after that was that the console that had all these preamps in it only offered six channels of phantom power. I, I, my head's in my hand. So I'd planned all my mics set up and I was using quite a lot of condenser mics. Yep. So at that point, I was like, I'm going to have to flip over all my patching oh. and stuff to get things into the right channel so that I can get the phantom power in the right places, swapping out condensers for ribbons and dynamics and things oh good god in the middle of all this we were trying to get signals i managed to get kick snare and overheads through mm. using other preamps they're independent preamps not the ones on the desk okay got some signal actually through to my system <laughs> and then we moved over to the piano mm -hmm. started micing up the piano which was actually his main instrument so i wanted to have lots of mic options and everything for there okay and i'd planned to put all that through the desk and it just seemed like Every other channel wasn't coming through. Oh god! You know, we had we had a dodgy mic cable. We had a mic that didn't work. We had like signal not getting from the desk, then back to the input that it was supposed to on the patch bay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then in the middle of this, I was of course trying to do everything I could in the background to get everything else set up so that we could just plug stuff up. Everything else ready. And in the process of that, I thought, okay, there's a mic on the list that I want to use, but I can't find a mic clip for it. So I asked him, have you got a mic clip for this mic? Yeah. And then he spent like 10 or 15 minutes trying to rig up some kind of homemade shock mount that he no, designed no. device for it. <laughs> While we still had almost no signals coming through the system. <laughs> Total lack of urgency. I was like, <laughs> am I the only person freaking out here? <laughs> and this was at about 10.45. And this feels to me like the most British problem possible. Because I feel like <laughs> a producer from another country, three minutes into that question, would have said, you know what? Stop. It's fine. I'll duct tape it. I'll use a different <laughs> mic, whatever it is. But just the social impossibility of interrupting him. Yeah. I feel it. I'm feeling you there. You know, it's rare that I come away thinking, you know, I should have been more of an asshole. Yeah. But that's probably one of those situations where I should have, like, stamped my foot and chucked some ashtrays mm. around or something. Screamed and screamed. And then there was the final straw. Oh, wow. Right, at this point, I'd already redesigned the system about five times. You know, when you just start doing that, after a while, your head just gets totally tangled up. And oh, yeah, yeah. You can barely think straight. It's just porridge. Yeah. I'm getting to the point where I'm thinking about damage limitation. I'm thinking, okay, what do we actually have? What can we provide, yeah. Can I use the channels that I've already line-checked and just put all the mics through those? Right. So I listened back to my kick, snare, and 
overhead mics and the overhead's gone down. Oh my god! They've gone all noisy. <laughs> oh my so, god! So at like ten minutes past eleven, I had a kick mic and a snare <laughs> mic to show for the entire morning's work. <laughs> to show for your two hours hard labour with two people. Yeah, and it was that point. My exact words to the tech guy were, "Okay." We are officially moving to plan B. I hope he was, at the very least, apologetic at this stage. I think I he mean, was feeling a little bit sheepish. Right, yeah, good. And um, I was thinking, okay, how can I solve this situation? And I remembered that the guy I was staying with, a lovely guy called Simon Gordiev, mm. he had an eight-channel Audient preamp. And I knew that they had D-subs on the back, and that I could literally just plug a D-sub between that and my inputs and get signals into my machine. Right. I rang him up, like quarter past 11, oh my God. and said... Simon, can you save my life for me, please? <laughs> and he, bless him, he took a taxi from his flat with the preamps. And not only did he have eight preamps, he had 16 channels of preamps Oh, in a little mini rack. And he came into the studio like half an hour later with all this stuff. <sighs> but before he arrived, after I'd just rung him, the client walks in at half past 11. <gasps> In advance of the 12 o'clock start to kind of get ready. Fair enough. That's good work ethic. I mean, I just thought, no, there's no way I can try and sweep this under the carpet. And so I, I was totally straight with him about the situation. I seem to remember using the exact words, total sh- show. <laughs> I said, look, I'm not entirely sure how long this is going to take, but give me another hour. Oh, wow. So basically I tore out everything that I could from the studio bypassed everything I could. You know, I plugged the audience preamps directly into my system via the D-subs. Right. I took a stage box from their live room through the control room door to avoid all their tie lines. Yeah. Plugged it directly into the back of the preamps and then plugged all the mics into that and used my like, SSL as the talk back and also as the headphone amp. I actually just extended the headphone amp into the live room as well. So you did everything you could to just take the studio's equipment out of the equation. Pretty much I did a location session in a studio yes yeah in a professional <laughs> berlin studio oh wow and it meant that as a result we started an hour late and we also lost an hour at the end of the day because we had to return the preamps and everything but once it started it went fine <sighs> oh my <laughs> my toes have just unclenched for the first time in 15 <laughs> minutes That's but a- honestly I, that was the most stressful session for probably 20 years I've, I've done. I can believe it. Simon said, when I rang him at quarter past 11, that my voice was audibly shaking on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and another gauge in hindsight of how stressful it was is that normally my biggest stress on a session is, you know, when you starting with any new client and you're getting your first sounds, yeah. you're really stressed about, oh, you know, are they going to like the sound? You know, this is where it could all come crumbling and where the trust is totally destroyed because they think I don't make any good sounds. Yep. And it was a measure of this session that when I got to that stage, it was a blessed relief. <laughs> <laughs> when that's normally the most stressful part of the process. Yeah, but now you're making music, at least. Mike, that sounds hella stressful. It was just astonishing. But also, I was thinking with hindsight, it's this kind of thing that, gives you confidence in future (laughs) you never want to go through situations like that but afterwards you think you know i can actually do this job you know it staves off that imposter syndrome that we all struggle with if with everything stacked against you like that you can come out swinging i think that speaks very well of what you can get done i'm still getting catharsis on this though (laughs) i believe it So, John, you have been scanning the uh, reader feedback for questions. What is it that the tea breakers are wanting to know this month? Oh, everything, Mike. They appreciate what fonts of infinite wisdom we are, and they come (laughs) pleading for our wisdom, for our advice, for our assistance. And from this mountain of desperate (laughs) missives, I have one here for us, uh, which begins, Dear Master Breakers, and just as an aside... We've tried to coin quite a lot of phrases on this show, trying to make us... Mm, mm. None of them None of them have really stuck around, except, <laughs> you know, Master Breakers, which is suspiciously sticky, if you'll excuse <laughs> the, the choice of phrasing. Anyhow, Dan Belfort says, Dear Master Breakers, what is the highest number of instruments one person can play? Okay, okay. Provisos. No engineering slash pulleys slash motors, etc. allowed. Right. Brackets, duct taping a beater to a foot is permissible. Oh, okay. Um, and also, bonus points are awarded for diverse instruments. Well, it's a kind of one-man band territory. That's the thing. Well, that's where my mind went at first, but 
we're not allowed strings and springs. Mm. So we want how many instruments can someone manually control? I mean, I'd immediately put in nose flute because that only needs your nose. So you've got one there. <laughs> Do you think there's an ass trumpet? <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite sure there is. Well, there's two already. In my preparation for this question, Mike, I only opened one web page. As exhaustive as ever. Because I thought it might come up. And I brought up the Wikipedia entry for nose flute. Oh, right. Because I knew <laughs> that's where you were going to take us. I didn't know it would be literally the first thing that you would say. <laughs> I'm delighted that I remain as predictable as ever. Um, so the, the one point I wanted to make about the nose flute <laughs> is... I had this assumption for the longest time that a nose flute was a flute you stuck up your nose. This, to me, didn't seem like an unreasonable assumption. It's not. It's one you place in front of your nose. Yeah, yeah. This may seem like a small distinction, (laughs) but I just wanted to offer that olive branch to anyone who, like me, was stuck with the image of this traditional Pacific (laughs) Islands instrument stuck up a nose and played like a flute. But, I mean, you'd have to, like, gaffer it in place. Yeah, I think that's allowed. So let's, Mm. starting from the top down, you have a nose flute, gaffered to your face. That's one, and I am keeping count here. Okay, uh, you can have harmonica. Yep, on that sort of mouth brace thing. Uh, harmonica, through which you can also sing. Okay. I just need to very quickly establish whether one can sing and play harmonica at the same time. Um, give me a song, please. Um, uh, happy birthday to you. <laughs> yes, it's fine and it sounds great. <laughs> Very possible. <laughs> that is the analog version of a mashup. <laughs> We've just heard this pioneering work by audio artist John Whitten. <laughs> it's really fun. It's re- I cannot recommend enough. <laughs> Getting hold of your harmonica and <laughs> singing through it. Even more fun than it sounds. Could you put a kazoo on the back end? <laughs> on the out of the harmonica? Yeah. You all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting is... a lovely mental image here. Okay, go. so the harmonica output goes to a kazoo. Yeah. Also, I think very reasonably, could go to the bag of a bagpipe. I suppose, yeah, yeah. You're exhaling anyway. You could use the doubler, couldn't you? How, how do you mean? Well, if you had a mic there, it could then trigger a synth. Oh, okay, I think that may be a bit electronic. Because right. once we get to electronic triggering... Yeah, that gets a bit gizmoish, doesn't it? All right, we're well, working down then. Working down. I mean, you could hit things with your head, couldn't you? <laughs> If you had your tam-tam, like Def Leppard's drummer, you have your tam-tam behind you, you could just kind of hit it backwards, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I think if you're going to take this challenge seriously, I think you need to be hitting things with your head. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, We then get to the neck, around which I can imagine a string of shakers, which you sort of hula hoop around, if you can imagine that. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting great dance moves as well. You can do the funky chicken and it'll... (laughs) This neck-based gyration, I, I deeply regret for this is an audio medium and there are our breakers are missing out on this. <laughs> Necklace of shakers. John walking like an Egyptian over there. <laughs> Precisely. Which brings us to sort of sternum and nipples, not known as musical areas. Hmm. Navel. I've not really got anything for these, I've got to say. Oh, don't belly dancers have like jingly things around their tummy? They do. Belly, bar- belly dancer tummy jinglers. To use the technical term, yeah. Great, that's on the list. But we've got arms. We're doing into the arm territory. So, I mean, obviously, your fingers. Ooh, I mean, how many different things could you play with a set of fingers, do you think? <laughs> well, as we said, bonus points for diverse instruments. So we need to have at least one finger on the bagpipe, which we're powering through the harmonica. Okay. Well, I mean, if we had a multi-manual church organ... Yes. ...then you could spread fingers across different manuals, maybe. I think big church organ is a must-have. And you could certainly have a synth. Like an analogue synth. Yep, an analogue synth is on there. I think we're still very much on one hand here that's got kind of the index finger on a bagpipe, middle finger and ring finger on two bits of the big organ and then the little finger playing a synth. But then on the other side, you'd have to have, I assume, your grand piano. (laughs) To begin with. Yeah. To begin with, yes. I mean, this is a little bit less elaborate than Dream Theatre, isn't it? (laughs) In fact... (laughs) I'm fairly certain we're going to see this set up on their next live tour. I, I would not be surprised. So. The difference is that they'll have it rigged up to a, like a pole so we can swing it round. Oh, oh the stagecraft. <laughs> <laughs> we, we cannot devote more minutes on this podcast to discussing the dream theatre piano pole. So what else could you be doing on that hand? Tom-toms. The thumb is just knocking some tom-toms as it goes. I could see that. The other three fingers could have small antique chimes on them. Oh, yeah, you could have finger symbols or castanets. Okay, yeah, both. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, why not have both? Okay, we're out of hand territory now. That's the most the hands can do. No, 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 no. wait. Oh, wait. You could have those Morris dancer spells on your arm. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to sound great, Mike. This is basically the European project <laughs> in a single... Forget Concord. Forget the Channel Tunnel. This is what's going to bring us together. I think so. I think we've just cancelled Brexit. This is amazing. Brilliant, yeah. We're down to the waist. What comes next is the knees... And I will not be persuaded differently. No, you missed out the arse trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can't not have the arse trumpet. You know what? I'm going to sacrifice my browser history for this podcast. <laughs> I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> Listeners as well, I'm now on every watch list there is as I Google arse trumpet. <laughs> And it looks like it's real. <laughs> oh, he shoots, he scores. <laughs> Nothing is so weird that the human imagination cannot think it up. Please, don't follow me down this trail. Let, <laughs> let me serve. As a sacrificial lamb. I'm going to write it. I'm going to never think of it again. <laughs> they exist. Fine. That's happened. Oh, dear. So are you going to have to knees? Okay, right. Um, uh, we, we've already got the Morris Dancer bells. Could you be sitting down and have something on your lap? Ah, uh, Yes. Yeah. A hurdy-gurdy. And the handle is attached to an elbow. You could be turning around. There you go. You turn that around and then you press the keys with your nose. The nose isn't doing anything yet. Well, you could just have the drone going. That's fine. That's true. Such an excellent word, hurdy-gurdy. I'm, I'm happy we got that one in. It is. It is a just wonderful word. Do you know there's an EDM folk festival called uh, Beat Hurdy-Gurdy? <laughs> That is some extremely narrow casting there. It's a shout out to all our, I don't know, ancient folk slash EDM fans. So we've got down to the knees. Are you going to have like the symbols between the knees, like the classic one man band thing? I feel like we've mined symbols for all they're worth at this stage. I'm not sure we can, okay. we can really get more. A tambourine then? Absolutely. Knees tambourine. I mean, you could have a tambourine on one knee and on the other knee you could have... You could have... Jingle bells. Sleigh bells. Let's make it festive. Sleigh bells. So you're hitting the uh, tambourine with the sleigh bells. But we can do one better. We can strap in between the knees. You could have one of those rubber bulb car horns. The ha ha yeah. things. Oh, yeah. Get the most that we can out those medium leg joints. <laughs> How does the hurdy-gurdy stay atop the two legs while they're opening and closing so rapidly? Practice. It's just practice. We're not saying this is easy. <laughs> This takes dedication. It takes blood and guts to be this random. Okay, so we're, we're on to the feet now. And given us how we're at a church organ, presumably there's a bit of bass pedalling going on. I reckon so. Foot manuals, whatever they're really called. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are they really called? The bottom bits of an organ. A pedal manual, I think, isn't it? If, if we're going to be snobbish about this, pedal manual means foot thing, hand thing. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> like... yeah. Well, don't worry, though. Organists aren't anal. They won't. <laughs> I have never met a group more willing to accept small mistakes than church organists. That's right, organists, we're throwing down. Come get us. Okay, so we've got one foot left, Mike. One there foot. There can only be one thing for it. A hi-hat. <laughs> <laughs> Surely. Agreed. I completely agree. I mean, apart from anything, because as audio engineers, if such an amazing event happened, we would have to record it. <laughs> yes. And if we recorded it, it would only be fitting for a Project Studio podcast that there's too much hi-hat over everything. <laughs> <laughs> I could not agree more. Right, can I just give you a very quick rundown of what oh, we're going to stamp our official opinion on this? Okay. Is the most instruments that a single person can play without mechanical or electronic assistance? <clears throat> I'm counting on my nose. Go on. Okay. Nose flute, harmonica, kazoo, bagpipe, vocalist, headbutt, tam tam, necklace of shakers, belly bouncer, tummy, jinglers, big church organ, analog synth, grand piano, tom toms, finger cymbals, castanets, Morris dancer bells, arse trumpet, hurdy gurdy, tambourine, sleigh bells, car horn, foot manual, hi hat. Whoa! <laughs> That's the lot. <laughs> wow, what did we get to? Was that like 17, 27? I thought you were counting! I think it was either 17 or 27, and I lost count. <laughs> I was getting worried you might expire. <laughs> Me too! I could see the veins popping out on the side of your neck. <laughs> I can feel them, believe. Okay, so somewhere between 17 and 27 instruments is where we put the reasonable limit of what one person can be expected to do. Yeah, I reckon so. I think our work here is done. Lovely. <laughs> So in honour of this month's What's Your Jam segment, I actually have the object of my jam fetish this month. I'm going to create the toast fully with it. Here we go. You Listening carefully. You know, that's very good. I'll admit to practising. <laughs> Can I offer one, one note? Yeah. 
Please never say jam fetish <laughs> ever again, Mike. On podcast or off, I'm just going to entreat you to, to steer clear of that phrasing the rest of your days. But besides that, it was great. Oh, and also, just speaking of toast, yeah. my daughter <laughs> came out with a great comment the other day. Oh, do tell. Because we were making breakfast and we were all making toast at different times. And I put some toast in for myself. Mm. And then when it popped, Lara snuck in. Nicked my toast and rushed off with it. I said, Lara, oh, that's my toast. And her reply was, The toast chooses the person, not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Just like these fabulous Zen undertones. You've got to watch that one with starting a cult or something. I would not be surprised to, to start seeing some bishoply robes in a small congregation <laughs> forming outside the house. Yeah. That's just magnificent. So, on to this month's jam. What we got? Now, I have a question for you. When was the last time you bought a record? Like a whole album? An uh, album or a single? Or do you just stream stuff now? Well, at a gig about three weeks ago, but not at a gig. It's been years. Okay. Now, do you remember the last time when you heard something, you know, back at that time when you were still buying records, when you heard something and you immediately had to buy the record? I do. What was it? <laughs> the strongest memory was the first time I ever heard Jamiroquai. Oh, okay. What, what, Travelling Without Moving? Uh, it was Virtual Insanity was the track that I heard. I can see that. And I just thought, well, damn, music. My strongest memory of this kind of thing also dates back from that time. Okay. Which is when I walked into the Cambridge branch of HMV and heard about 10 seconds of Fiona Apple's debut single, Sleep to Dream, Mm -hmm. and basically turned on my heel and walked straight up to the counter and said, I want to buy that record, please, (laughs) without knowing what it was or who she was. That thing that's happening. The thing is, because of the way I do things now, I often have bought a record before I hear it. Okay. So I've not found myself in that situation very often. And so I've heard records where I think if I'd heard them before I bought them, I would have gone out and bought them. But I was beginning to think, to be honest, that I was just getting a bit too old and jaded for that kind of thing. For that hearing a track and just knowing you had to have it. It's been like 20 years since that happened, and I've not really had that same visceral impulse, I've got to buy that record yeah so i thought well yeah maybe i'm just getting old and crusty and that's that's just the way <laughs> things are until a couple of months ago it happened again okay there's there's a bright light when i heard in the uk charts a single by a singer called billy eilish called bury a friend mm. I, I mean up to that point that was her highest charting single it got to like, number six in the uk it hit number 14 in the us mm-hmm. and honestly it is the most exciting thing i've heard in the charts for years mm. Absolutely incredible. And she's only 17. She did this thing with her brother, who's 21. (laughs) Oh, my God. It's absolutely nutcase. It's very dark, very atmospheric. It's kind of... Portis head crossed with Lord in that you've got these bloated kind of trip hop beats and intricate crusty sound design mm. with incredibly detailed and varied vocal arrangements and super bold production moves. Honestly, Bury a Friend to me, I think probably has the boldest six seconds of record production I've ever heard, yeah. which is in the middle of it, it suddenly just goes to a low frequency tone for two seconds <laughs> and then stops for two seconds <laughs> and then goes back to the tone for two seconds. And you're like, has the song ended? Mm, mm. And this is in a top 10 chart song. And the thing is, with hindsight, like all the genius production moves, you look back on it and go, well, obviously someone could do that. Yeah. But they thought it up when it didn't exist. Before it had been done. And that's just incredible to me. There's so much fabulous sound design going on. I mean, Bury a Friend has a kind of a really creepy atmosphere to it. And it honestly sounds like the trailer to some kind of horror game franchise (laughs) because it's so detailed and and I say that as a compliment Mm -hmm. I mean there are things like dentist drills Mm. and squeaking doors and metal stress and stuff and it's just brilliant (laughs) and in fact it has a very creepy horror themed kind of video to it oh I haven't seen the video but it's a credit to how good I think the actual music production is that when I saw the video it actually made the music less effective not more (laughs) ha Right. It was stronger, I thought, as a production without the video than it was with it, mm-hmm. which is pretty unusual, really. Which is a rare thing. And I love the fact that they're so economical with their means. They don't use much stuff, so they can really turn it up and you can hear the details. She often sings really, really quietly. Mm-hmm. And so he can turn it up super loud and it feels really intimate and in your face and you can't get away from it. Yeah. And yet she's not mumbling. You can hear every word. It's so beautifully produced. Yeah. So when I heard that, like within about 30 
seconds. I was like, okay, pre-order. <laughs> I just ordered the album blind because I thought, no, it's such a good single. I can't not buy the album. I need to hear more what they're doing. And the album is even better. No. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. The, the thing <laughs> is that Bury a Friend is that kind of creepy thing. And I thought it might just be that. Mm. And the rest might be a bit also ran. But you get that. But it has the whole way through the album is a very coherent mood and an atmosphere, this very kind of slightly claustrophobic and almost slightly paranoid atmosphere, and yet it has a much broader emotional range. You know, you get things that are honestly teary up beautiful. Mm. There's these amazingly mature jazz influences that come in, Mm. the harmonic work of really tremendous beauty. And she comes through all these different kind of uh, emotional zones as a singer from like fragility through to the menacing bits of Bury a Friend. And all these incredible production moves, like, for example, this one track where it's starting off quite jazzy, and then this massive bass sound comes in, and whenever the bass plays a note, everything else in the track goes a bit weird. It gets a bit distorted and kind of panny and phasey and stuff. Hmm. And it's such a simple idea, and you've never heard anyone do it, and it's brilliant. (laughs) It demands to be listened to, like, in the dark without distractions. Yeah, It's so good, actually, that I found it difficult to write about it because I just wanted to listen to it. You just wanted to hear? Ah. Now, at the time I heard it, Bury a Friend was the highest single she'd done. It got to number six in the UK, as I said. Mm. I heard it and I thought, this is just too out there, really, to be mainstream. I'm amazed it's got into the top ten. I'm pleased about it. And I wrote about it for the mag, and I basically said, look, this... I think this is the most exciting thing I've heard in 20 years. It's brilliant. It's great art. And that was like published last month. I mean, I wrote it a couple of months ago. Mm. And the album was released uh, a couple of weeks ago, 29th of March. Okay. And since then, the album has gone number one in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, New Zealand, Ireland, Australia, Canada, the UK, and America. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> and so it's this fabulous thing of... Not only does it restore my faith in people appreciating great art, because I really do think it's great art, Mm. but it also makes me just feel incredibly smug. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, of course, I knew it all along. (laughs) What a combination. And I'm just so pleased about it. It just makes me happy thinking about it, even though it's by no means a happy record. In fact, one of the only criticisms I would make of it is it's got a very strong self-harm suicide theme running through it. Okay, okay. It just feels like it's glamorising self-harm and suicide. Yeah. And the difficulty is that I don't want to stop artists doing that kind of thing. Because you could say the same about, what, Nirvana. You know, they've done great songs that are about abuse. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to tarnish the art by saying that they can't write about that kind of stuff, but it does make it a little bit uncomfortable to listen to. Artists should be able to write about suicide and self-harm and all these things, and, like, making these inaccessible topics will do nothing to help anyone. It's a record that reminds you that free speech is not just a right, but it's also a duty. Hmm. You know, it's a right for you to be able to say what you want, but it's a duty within a free speech society to allow people to say things that you feel uncomfortable about. Yeah, that you're unhappy with being said. And I, and I kind of defend her doing that, even though it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable listening to it. It makes me l- less inclined to play it to my daughters, for example. <laughs> well, I mean, I was going to say, if I were a parent, I would absolutely have those concerns, especially when the music is so damn good. I haven't had a chance to get to the album yet. My first encounter with this music was 15 minutes before we started recording and Mike sent it over to me and I listened to it from start to finish and then I started it again and I did that twice. I listened to the track three times because I just couldn't think of anything in that moment I would have rather done Hmm. than listen to that song again. It's very good. The other downside of it is that I was really hoping to tap up the brother for an SOS interview because I'm desperate to know how he put it together. <laughs> but I think, given the success, I think it's getting increasingly unlikely <laughs> <laughs> that he'll have a, even a, a second free. Oh, he needs to be grateful because it is surely the SOS mix review which got it as the number one album. Well, obviously, I'm taking credit. Oh, yeah, I think he owes you more than an interview. <laughs> So if any of our listeners are 21 and know how to get in touch with 21-year-olds, whether we should Snapchat him or yep. Insta his MySpace mm, SoundCloud mm. Or, or exactly what, then do let us know and we'll, uh, we'll get on that. And that music lets us know that it is time once again to wind down our tea break and struggle back to work. Just before we do, though, we have time to... Thank this month's very generous sponsor, Modular Acoustics. Have you come across these guys, Mike? It um, doesn't ring a bell. (laughs) They are blowing up, as I'm sure none of us know. Um, 
riding off the back of the explosion of interest in modular synthesis. Oh, of course, yeah. They have introduced modular acoustics, modular pianos, mm. which are, of course, empty boxes that uh, you can put anything under the hammers that you like. So you can have a bit of clavichord for the lower registers. Even more so than that. I mean, you're thinking like a fusty old person, oldie there. You see, that's the problem. I'm so last generation, yeah. They suggest putting things like pudding or... <laughs> Toes <laughs> underneath some of the hammers. I can immediately see an application. Can you put toast under some of the hammers? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask if they can sort that out as part of this sponsorship deal. Expansion pack. Also, there's there's modular trumpets where you just screw random bits of piping together. Mm. Early reviews have noted that the sounds created by these instruments are chaotic, strange, <laughs> and barely resembling music. A ringing endorsement. I think if we're aiming to... <laughs> Emulate modular synthesis. I think there's no higher endorsement. I can see the family resemblance. Yeah, right. Mm. I think that's the swing and a hit there. So our <laughs> congratulations to uh, Modular Acoustics and our thanks for them supporting this podcast. And if you would like to send your own thanks or would you like to send us a question or generally get in contact, the email address is tbreak at projectstudioteabreak.com and our website is very similar, www.projectstudioteabreak.com. We are on Patreon. Where can they find that, Mike? Uh, that is patreon.com slash Project Studio Tea Break. And we have, as usual, more extras this month. We have important discussion of Shropshire, Smittens, and the Millennial Whoop. <laughs> All important things that we have settled. I can't believe that we talked about Smittens. I'm a bit scared about that getting out into the world, <laughs> but, but we can live with that. And also, I would make an appeal. Just let people know. If you think there's someone who might enjoy our brand of nonsense, let them know. Send them an email. Do they still have emails? Anyone, <laughs> anyone you want to afflict our particular brand of humour on, um, <laughs> please drop us a review on iTunes. Mm. Uh, if you get a chance, that's the best way for us to grow. Indeed. Um, and any questions, any comments you may have, we are on email. As said, we are also on Twitter at twitter.com slash pstbtweets. And we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash pstbbooks or just search Project Studio Tea Break. I'm... Um, Shocked. <laughs> Why are you shocked? And you got through that in one go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all we have time for, and we look forward to seeing you in the 14th upcoming episode of Project Studio Tea Break. Ta-ra, pets. Ta-da. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs>